We're live. Welcome back. This is part two of chapter 10 of biochem. Today we will be talking about the electron transport chain and oxidative phosphorylation. I said that we need a bit of audience participation today. So the first thing we're going to do is I want you guys to tell me the reduction potentials of the following things. Look them up and let me know. NAD, FAD, cytochrome C, coenzyme Q, and oxygen. Tell me the reduction potentials of those. Yes. Well, don't tell me yet. Just write them down, and then I'll ask what everyone got later. There's a reason I'm telling you to look all this up. I want you guys to remember it. And if I hand it to you, it's not going to happen. Look up the reduction potentials of the following things. Who has the reduction potential of NAD? Anyone? Negative what? Negative what? 32? 0.32 or 32? 0.32. FAD. Cytochrome C. Zero point two five, right? Positive. Zero point two five. Coins on Q. Yeah, this one might be hard to find. Oxygen. That one should be very easy to find, the reduction potential of oxygen. But oxygen into water. Not oxygen to hydroxide, not oxygen to superoxide, oxygen into water. 1.2? Yeah, 1.2. 0.8, 0.82? Eh, yeah, let's say that. Why did I tell you to look all these up? Well, who knows the relevance of all of those compounds in the first place? All of them are involved in the electron transport chain, right? All of them are involved in the electron transport chain. And do you remember what I said about the electron transport chain? The electron transport chain is what? It's just a cycle of hopping electro, electro favorability. Electrochemical favorability is what the electron tra transport chain is all about. So you guys know that in the electron transport chain, we have complex one, and then we have complex two, and then we have complex three, and then you have complex four, right? All right, but before we do all that, let's localize where we are in the cell, right? So let's go back and talk about all of our journeys with our single molecule of glucose. He started in the mouth, and then he got to the stomach, and he got absorbed, and he went to the liver or the pancreas or whatever, and then the insulin went through, and then he went through the GLUT4 transporter, went into the cell. And when he went into the cell, he got trapped in the cell by hexokinase. And then he underwent a glycolysis. He got turned to pyruvate, right? And glycolysis gave us a net of two ATP. And the pyruvate gets turned into? Pyruvate gets turned into? In the presence of oxygen, pyruvate gets turned into? Acetyl-CoA, right? Through the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. And that gives us an NADH, right? And then that is going to happen inside of where? 
the conversion of pyruvate into acetyl-CoA happens in the? The, the mitochondria. Not the matrix yet. Actually, it might happen in the matrix. I don't know. I, I don't know exactly what happens, but I know it happens in the mitochondria. And we know that the mitochondria has a double layer, right? The first layer is known as the outer layer, and the second layer is known as the inner layer, right? Outer, inner. The inner layer has these folds. What are those folds called? Christae, Christae, right? And we used to have a friend named Krista back in, back in uh, undergrad, and we used to be like, ah, Christae, right? And why do we have Christae along there? Well, we know that the TCA cycle happens inside of this space called the matrix, right? So inside the inner membrane, we have the matrix. We're Neo, right? And then outside the uh, matrix, but between the two layers, we have the? It's between two membranes. It's a space between two membranes. So it's the? Intermembrane space, right? The intermembrane space. Right. So the intermembrane space is where we have a lot of the functions of the mitochondria going on, but the matrix specifically is where we have the TCA cycle going on. So where does the ETC fit into all of this? Well, the ETC is a collection of transmembrane proteins and channels, right? And transmembrane against where? Let's zoom in right here and let's draw that. We're going to have complex one here and complex two here, complex three here, complex four here, and ATP synthase. And it's going to be along the inner membrane. That's where the ETC takes place. It takes place along the inner membrane. Right. So someone knowing that, tell me, why does, why does our, e, our inner membrane have folds? Why does it have folds? Increased surface area. Increased surface area of what? Yeah. Yeah, right. So if you have folds, right, so let's say, have any of you guys ever heard the coastline paradox before? No. Right. So the coastline paradox basically says, like, let's say that you have a country, and the country is shaped like this. Right? That's the country. And you wanted to measure this country in 100 kilometer intervals. Right? So you measure 100 kilometers like this, and then 100 kilometers like that, and then 100 kilometers like that, and then 100 kilometers like that. But do you see how much of the, of the curve you're missing? So then you decide you're going to do it in 50 kilometer intervals. So you do 50 kilometers like this and 50 kilometers like that, but then you're missing smaller curves and smaller curves and smaller curves. So the coastline paradox says that the smaller your interval of measurement, the greater the circumference of your country. So it's a, it's a paradox. But it's not a paradox, because if you study geometry or topology or physics, you'll realize that coastlines are something known as fractals. If you, in, if you zoom in on them on a very, very small level until you get to Planck's length, like Planck's constant, um, sorry, Planck's length, not the constant, if you, if you measure them by Planck's length, they'll be infinite. The coastline actually has infinite length, depending on how small the unit of measurement is. Right? The same thing with this. If you, zoom, if you fold it and then you zoom in, there's now more space for you to fit all of these proteins. Right? Because you've just made the actual coastline longer by folding it in on itself. Does that make sense? It's a very strange connection. Just a weird fact I know. It's the philosophy in me coming out. Paradoxes and stuff like that. All right. Cool. So who here knows the role? So we talked about where it is. Who here knows the role of the electron transport chain? Yeah, it generates ATP. How? I'm about to tell you, yeah, that is, that is absolutely true. I love the snark smile on your face while you said that. Yeah, I guess it is my job to tell you, unfortunately. What's up? Right. Exactly. So, so the electron transport chain is a completely aerobic process, right? So I want you guys to remember a couple of golden rules of the electron transport chain. Here are your rules. Number one, it's overall favorable. Meaning that the delta G is negative. Number two, its main job is ATP production from ADP and PI. So all those ATPs that we hydrolyze in our body and produce phos inorganic phosphates and ADP, they kind of circle back. Either we make them, or we recycle them, or whatever. But ATP synthase, at the end of the electron transport chain, is going to produce ATP from those components. right? And we'll talk about that. Also, understand that um, when biochemists talk about the electron transport chain, um, 
they talk about complex one through four. And when they talk about oxidative phosphorylation, they talk about ATP synthase. So ATP synthase, synthase, ATP synthase isn't necessarily part of the electron transport chain. They're independent of one another. OK. Third rule. Oxygen is the final, final what? Electron acceptor. And four, energy is produced through redox and concentration gradients. Concentration gradients. Energy is produced through redox and concentration gradients. What do I mean by concentration gradients? Hmm? Right. But what do I mean by concentration gradients in general? How do they produce energy? Right. So copy those down, and we'll talk about it in a second. I heard you were studying for Orgo last time. Did it pay off? Yes. Good. I'm happy to hear it. Also, um, oh, by the way, for everyone watching back home, check out the description for everything. Everything. Um, I know your semester ends next week. So you guys get back on the 2nd, January, or the 3rd? No, wait, 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 wait. You guys... You guys have a really long winter break. I forgot. I get back on the second. Um, so we'll, we'll restart then. Hopefully, I can get our schedule shifted to Monday, Wednesday. I'll send out an email. I'm sure you guys will put it in the group chat or something. Um, huh? It's not going to work. So who here can't do Tuesday, Thursday because of biochem? That's fine. Yeah, we'll just move it. We'll move it up 30 minutes from 6 to 9 to 6.30 to 9.30. That's fine. Mm. We'll, talk, we'll talk about it after the lesson. Let's talk about it after the lesson. Huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. OK. Yeah, so we'll, we'll talk about it after the lesson. Um, everyone has those down? OK. So let's start to talk about these individual complexes. OK. So uh, before we talk about the complex, there's so many like, small nitty gritty details that I could like, continue to talk about. So what do we mean by this whole um, concentration gradient thing? So let's say we have the outer membrane, big old outer membrane. And then we've got the inner membrane. I feel so bad for the camera. They have to hear me like crinkling through the fucking. We have a big old inner membrane that I'm going to draw in black. So basically, complexes one, three, and four, right, are going to pump protons out into the intermembrane space. And it's going to pump so much proton, actually, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, to 1, that the intermembrane space has a pH one point lower than the matrix, meaning that the hydrogen ion concentration, the ratio is 10 to 1. Because remember that the pH scale is a logarithmic scale. But if, if the concentration here is high, so if the hydrogen ion concentration here is high and the hydrogen ion concentration here is low, how are we pumping out? Weird. Same thing as in a neuron. So let's say that we have a neuron. And that neuron 
is in this stage of its action potential, the hyperpolarization stage. And we know that regardless of what happened, right, the sodium concentration and the potassium concentration, it's higher where? The sodium concentration is higher where? Out. Out. And potassium concentration is high here. But during this phase, sodium goes out and potassium comes in. How? How do we get them to move against their gradient? For the neuron, we use what? A sodium potassium pump. Na plus, K plus, what's the rest? Na plus, K plus? ATPase. We use energy to pump things against their concentration gradient. Right. So when we're pumping the hydrogens out against their concentration gradient, clearly we're using ATP. Right? Wrong. Why would it be stupid to use ATP? We're trying to make it. So why would we use ATP? Right, so we got to find another way. We got to find another way to produce enough energy to pump that out. Because I'll tell you right now, from personal experience uh, swimming around in the mitochondria, right, this does happen, right? So we got to find a different way to pump things against their concentration gradient. So what, what are we going to use? Energy is produced through con concentration gradients and redox. Redox. We use reduction and oxidation reactions to produce energy that is favorably coupled to the pumping of hydrogen ions out into the intermembrane space against their concentration gradient. Right. That makes sense. Yeah? And then once all of this, once all of this builds up over here, right, I want you guys to think about something. So you can't come back. It's completely locked out from coming back, except, except for a very, very, very small pinhole somewhere at the end over here, right? So let's say that you took a gallon of water, right? And you kept inject like a gallon bottle of water, right? And you kept injecting more and more and more water into this gallon of water. What's going to happen? The pressure is going to build up, right? And then when you pop the cap of that gallon of water, what's going to happen? The water's gonna explode out, right? And what happens to the gallon of water? Like, actually, better example, for all, for all the boys here, right? Back in elementary school, do you guys remember taking a Poland Spring water bottle like that and twisting it and untwisting the cap a little bit and then twisting and twisting and twisting, and then the cap popped off, right? And then what came out of the top of the bottle? Smoke. Smoke. Why? Heat. It's energy, right? Because that pressure. The potential energy locked in within that, all that pressure turned into thermal energy. There was a heat transfer that took place. So what I want you guys to think about is this is almost like twisting that bottle until you build up more and more and more pressure. And then ATP synthase is like the top of that thing popping off. And when it pops off, it creates enough energy. And we use that energy to do what? We use that energy to make ATP. We use that energy to make ATP. We take the phosphate and we attach it to the ADP using the energy of that coming back down. So when people say proton motive force, right, this proton motive force of them coming back down this way that produces ATP, this little explosion of energy that happens right here, this proton motive force is literally just pressure. It's pressure of the hydrogens coming back down in a favorable process, because they go from high concentration to low concentration. Do you guys see how that's going to power the formation of a bond, right? So, but we didn't talk about the most basic thing here. We didn't talk about the most basic thing. So we use the redox reactions to pump these, and then these, the pressure builds up, they come back down, and then them coming back down uh, along their concentration gradient allows for the hooking up of the phosphate with the ADP. That makes the energy, and the energy is then stored where? So we have adenosine, and then we have phosphate, phosphate, phosphate. The energy is now stored inside of that bond. So all the energy that came out of the redox went towards pumping, came to this, and got stored in that bond. It's the transfer of energy, right? But why does the redox make energy in the first place? Because certain things like to be reduced more than others. And if you like to be reduced more than another thing, when you get reduced, 
you release a little bit of energy, right? It's almost like, you know, doing someone a favor. You do someone a favor, they're happy, right? You slip them, you slip them a little bit of money, give them a meal, they're really happy, right? Could have made a much looter um, yeah. connection there. Let's find the, uh, the reduction potential of coenzyme Q. Zero point zero four five. So, huh? Why is it so small? Why is this so small? What'd you find? I doubt that. Negative zero point nine five. These, these kind of make sense to me, and, and I'll show you why they make sense in a second. Let's put these. I don't know why I rolled the complexes. We're not ready to talk about that yet. <laughs> Let's put these in order of their favorability to get reduced. Which one gets reduced the most, and which one gets reduced the least? Oxygen the most. Oxygen the most, right? So let's, let's put O2. I want all of you guys to copy this down. Like, without fail. I want every single one of you to understand this really well. Because if you understand this, you'll never forget how electrons travel in the electron transport chain. You'll never forget it. So, O2 is the greatest. It wants to be reduced the most. Then, cytochrome C, right? Then, uh, coenzyme Q. Coenzyme Q which we're just going to call Q, Q ox, right? Then, oh, sorry, there's no plus there. My bad. FAD, then, because it's not involved in any sugar metabolism, except for the pentose phosphate pathway. Hmm. Who sees a pattern here? Any of my biochem people? Do any of you guys know the electron transport chain yet? Have you guys studied it yet? Right. So let's, let's, let's talk about it. So uh, now, now that you have this down, now that you have that copied down, everyone put your pencils down. Everyone. Just put your shit down, turn off your screens, everything. Just look at the board. Complex one is a complex between NAD and Q. And I'm going to tell you that this gives electrons to that. So it's NADH, Q, right? Complex two is FADH2, Q. Complex three is QH2, which is the reduced form of Q, cytochrome C, oxidized. And then complex four is Cytochrome C reduced oxygen. Who sees a pattern here? What's up? The, the chain goes over of the chain more electrons. One to three, two to three, three to four, four to five. Each complex is more favorable than the last with the exception of complex two. And remember what I said, which complexes I said did the pumping of H plus? One, three, and four. Complex two does not generate enough reduction energy to pump protons, because these are too close together. But complex one does, and then complex three does, and complex four does. Do you guys see how you're climbing the ladder of favorability as you go along the electron transport chain? Isn't that crazy? Isn't that just beautiful? Hmm. 
blew my mind the first time I studied that. E, e red minus E ox equals E reaction, right? N delta G equals negative N F E. You, calculate me the E reaction of complex one and complex two. Not just him, everyone. to know what gets oxidized and what gets reduced. So I'll give you a hint. In complex one, NADH comes as its reduced form. So it gets oxidized, and Q gets reduced. And I'll give you another hint. All of these get oxidized, and all of these get reduced. So what's the E standard of complex one? It's going to be whatever gets uh, reduced, right, which is Q, which is 0 0.045 minus a negative 0 0.32. And then E2 is going to be 0 0.045 minus a negative 0 0.18. So this is just 0 0.18. Um, plus 0 0.045, right? So that's going to be what? 0 0.11, hold on. No, sorry. 0 0.225, right? I think, 225. And then here is going to be 0 0.32 plus 0 0.045, which is 5, 6, 3, 0 0.385. 0 0.385 is for complex 1. 0 0.225 is for complex 2. If delta G equals negative NFE, the delta G goes lower as the E standard gets higher. Which of these has a higher E standard? Complex 1. Complex 2 doesn't generate enough energy to pump protons. It's not as favorable. And I'll tell you right now that complex 3 is more favorable than 1, and complex 4 is more favorable than 3. That's why I said those numbers make sense, just looking at them. Do you guys get it from a mathematical perspective now? So let's look at it from a scientific perspective. And does it make sense why O2 is the final electron acceptor? It's the most favorable. It's the most favorable, so it releases the most energy. You're getting to there. Because if it wasn't the most favorable, there would be no reason for cytochrome C to pass off its electrons to it, right? OK. Very good. So which of you is uh, helping me teach this class next year? Shot not. <laughs> You'll be around. You'll be there to catch my mistakes when I make them. No. Complex one. is known as NADH CoQ oxidoreductase. 
NADH CoQ oxidoreductase. It transfers electrons from NADH and H plus to coenzyme Q. And I'm going to write it as Q ox, right? Q in its oxidized form. But you don't really need to write Q ox. Some people write Q ox, Q red. I write Q, and do you guys know what I, you guys remember what I use as the reduced form of Q? QH2. Q and QH2. What was Q again? It was something that kind of looked like this. The, there's a component of the molecule that looks like this. A quinone. And then when you reduce it, it turns into a diphenol or a quinol, right, I think. Ubiquinone, I forgot. Ubiquinol, yeah. Ubiquinol and then ubiquinone. Also, all of that that I just explained, that's not all of the electron transfers that happen inside the electron transport chain. There are some that happen within the complexes before they get to other places. We'll talk about them. They're not super high yield, but they will come up every now and again. That's why I don't focus on them. You guys remember, this, is, this course, this lecture that I'm giving, is very general. These are the general high yield concepts. OK, so this is Q and QH2, right? OK. But before it transfers from NADH to Q, right, it transfers through something known as there's a little carrier molecule. There's actually two carrier molecules. So intermediates include FMN, flavin mononucleotide, right? FMN, which holds electrons, and Iron sulfur clusters that transfer electrons. And what I want you to know is that the electrons are transferred in pairs. The electrons are transferred in pairs. I sound like an idiot saying that, don't I? When are electrons not transferred in pairs? Other than radicals, other than radicals. Because those are those like, if we created radicals in this, we might as well just give up. It's, the whole thing's going to explode, right? But actually, foreshadowing, I shouldn't say that. <laughs> there are radicals involved in the electron transport chain. Very, very well controlled radical chemistry. Right. So we have iron sulfur clusters. So sometimes you'll get a discrete question on the MCAT, and it'll tell you all about the electron transfer, and it'll be like, which of the following transition metals is highly implicated in the electron transport chain? And it's iron. It's iron. So the NADH transfers onto FMN. The FMN transfers onto the iron clusters. And then the iron clusters transfer onto coenzyme Q. And all of that is favorable, right? The overall reaction is ah, makes sense why I always put that H plus there now, doesn't it? And that overall reaction, like we said before, has an E standard that is positive. Therefore, the delta G is negative. And this delta G is negative enough to pump protons into 
the intermembrane space against their concentration gradient. Yes? Good. So, all good? Wonderful. Either you guys are very smart or you're lying. Because there's no way that I would be able to follow all of this when I was an orgo. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> that's that's the humbling statement I needed. <laughs> no, he's. <laughs> I said, there's no way I'd be able to follow this when I was an orgo. And he says, have you heard me open my mouth? <laughs> like, <laughs> complex two. The ugly duckling of the family. It is a little special, just like me. It is called succinate CoQ oxidoreductase. Who can tell me why? Where? Not even why. Who? What the fuck is he doing here? Where did he come from? Where did he come from? Exactly. Yeah. And why does that make sense? So you have the mitochondria, and you have the inner membrane, and you're trying to you're trying to get electrons in along the inner membrane and pump protons out to the inner membrane space. So this is complex one, and it's doing its job, and this is complex two, and it's doing its job. But, but, well, first of all, the TCA cycle that's going on over here, right? The TCA cycle that's kicking is producing NADH and H plus, and all it has to do is travel over here. And then it gets turned back into NAD, and where does it go after it gets turned back in? It goes back to the TCA cycle. Easy. The TCA cycle is also producing succinate. And succinate can float its way over to complex two, and complex two holds FAD. It's literally holding the FAD. So basically what's happening is this is complex two, and the FAD is here. So the succinate actually does the work. Because FAD is a lazy piece of shit. And succinate comes and gets oxidized by the FAD and turned into fumarate. Fumarate looks like. that. And we're taking this, and we're taking that. And the FAD turns into FADH2. I can't animate it, but you guys can understand that it swaps, and then the FAD turns into FADH2, right? So it's attached to complex 2. So much so that people say the enzyme succinate dehydrogenase is complex 2. That's not necessarily true, but succinate dehydrogenase is here. It's associated with complex two. So complex two holds not only the FAD, but the FAD is part of a larger portion of a molecule called succinate dehydrogenase. Succinate dehydrogenase is closely associated with complex two, and complex two does not produce enough energy to do what? Pump protons. It doesn't pump protons. It's a lame duck. That's why it's called succinate CoQ oxidoreductase. So where are these uh, electrons going to go after they transfer off the succinate? They go into the FAD, making FADH2. The FADH2 then transfers it to, so, so we've got succinate to FAD, 
which makes FADH2, and then that transfers it onto more uh, iron sulfur clusters. The iron sulfur clusters are implicated again. Right. So it begins with succinate. And technically, one of the intermediates is FAD and iron sulfur clusters. Electrons are transferred in, in pairs. pairs. Electrons are transferred in pairs. And one last time for all the people back home, there is no pumping. Complex two is very celibate. No pumping. I hate, I hate my life. <laughs> huh? No, <laughs> not till marriage. No premarital pumping. <laughs> Get married. <laughs> yeah, it's that simple. Totally. Huh? What, you sound like my mom. <laughs> Dude, I can hardly take care of myself. You think I want a second human being, or maybe even a third, to take care of? Fuck no! You think I have time to deal with in-laws? I can hardly deal with all of you. <laughs> if my wife's watching this, man, fuck you. <laughs> Yeah, she'll remember that. I should cut that out of the video. <laughs> oh my god. Everyone get that? Yeah. Yeah? Okay. So what's the overall reaction of what's the overall reaction of um, complex two? Let's take a look. It's a lot easier to see it if we look at it like this, where we have succinate, right? And remember I drew in those two protons right there, like that, right? And that's going to encounter Q. And those H2s go away, right? Boom. Stolen, gone. Old me's dead and gone. You guys know that song? You guys remember that? What was that, 2006? You guys too young for that? No. Hold on. He wasn't born yet. <laughs> Wait, we'll, we'll play that song. Hold on. Oh, no, I'm going to get flagged on YouTube if I play it. We'll play it later. Yeah, right? So that, that makes sense, right? The, the protons get stolen from there. Cool. Okay, next, what comes after complex two? It's not a trick question. Complex three, yeah. Complex three is just a stupid, ugly, fat, dumb bitch. I, I hate complex three. Complex three. I've been traveling down this road too long. Just trying to find my way back home. Where was I? All right, where are my notes? There we go. Ooh, okay. Now, this is, this is kind of where it gets a little fucky. This is, this is where it gets a little fucky. 
yeah, this is, this is where it starts to get fucky. So complex three begins with QH2. So QH2 transfers the electrons, right? And there's no real, you know, there's no real intermediate here. It just kind of goes from, it just kind of goes from Q to cytochrome C, right? But there is, there is like a, a small caveat, right? You don't necessarily need to know how or why, but the Q goes through something known as a Q cycle. And the diagram I have here isn't that great for it. So I'm going to look up something on Google Images to explain this better. That's good. Eh, it's OK. Oh, I'm trying to look for a good diagram of this because the one in the book just isn't amazing. And I want to do this properly if I'm going to do it. Yeah, that's good. Follow along with me for a second. QH2, right? QH2 is basically going to get oxidized by cytochrome C. And when it gets oxidized by cytochrome C, and it gives off its electron, and notice I said electron, because this is the complex where electrons are transferred singly, or one at a time. One at a time. One electron at a time. So it goes cytochrome C ox to cytochrome C reduced. And the way that happens is because cytochrome C has iron 3 plus in it, and that iron 3 plus turns into iron 2 plus. And that's going to make something known as the Q radical anion. And the H that got plucked off along with those electrons, the proton gets pumped into the intermembrane space. Right? And it's, it's followed by H plus pumping out. This Q, this Q is going to transfer an electron to another Q radical anion down in somewhere else in the complex. And when it does that, it's going to turn into regular Q. And it can go get recycled. And this Q radical anion is going to interact with some other compounds and it can turn back into QH2. If it receives another electron and another if it receives another electron and another proton, it can turn back into QH2. So basically, this isn't exactly what happens, right? This is just a diagram I'm reading off of. I don't 100% know what goes on, right? I never studied it in depth. You don't have to. But what you have to understand is that the electrons get plucked off one at a time, which makes this cycle, right, that allows for all this to happen. Now, why? Why is this all happening in the first place? Why is this all happening in the first place? Anyone know? To pump hydrogen. Oh, yeah, to pump hydrogen, yes. But why do we start plucking the electrons off one at a time? Ah, yes, here it is. 
So this is intermembrane space, matrix over here. Some of the H plus from the matrix is gonna help to get that back. That's the piece I was missing. And you see that the H plus coming in from the, from the in matrix is gonna get pumped out anyways. It's gonna come here, get pumped out, come here, get pumped out, come here, get pumped out, right? Yes? Cool. So this is known as the Q pool or the Q cycle. I have two questions. Number one, why one electron? And number two, how is the radical allowed? Why the one electron? And how is the radical allowed? Because the one electron is going on to cytochrome C, and we see that the Fe3 plus becomes Fe2 plus. That makes sense, right? So what's, what's, normally, what's naturally happening is that Fe3 plus, one electron, Fe2 plus, right? That, and that's so normal for us. To, that is so easy for us to see. But why the sudden change? There has to be a reason. We were going pair, pair, one electron. We have to be preparing for something. Right? There has to be a reason that cytochrome C functions on one electron and everything else functions on two. What's cytochrome C going to pass off to? Oxygen. oxygen. And oxygen picks up electrons how many at a time? One. Oxygen picks up electrons one at a time. So in order for the favorability at the end, in order for oxygen to be the final electron acceptor, we start to transfer the electrons one at a time. Yeah, what's up? Here? Yeah. That's a really good question. I'm asking you. Like, you, you yeah, right. Like you don't. You, we don't want to make radicals. You don't want to make radicals in the presence of water and hydrogens and Q and cytochrome. You're gonna fuck up the whole thing. You're gonna fuck everything right up. So why is that allowed? Huh? No, clearly. But that's a good point. Yes, they, it is stabilized somehow. Tell me how. Keep going. Run. Keep running. What, what is it? Well, well what, is it? what is the radical? What is the actual radical? It's Q radical, right? Is the Q stabilized somehow? What is Q? Huh? A quinone. And what's a quinone? Yes. Very good. So what, what did I say was QH2? QH2 is? If you make a radical out of this, that radical is just going to resonate into the ring. And it's not going to react with anything. It's not going to react with anything. This is the same thing as using tyrosine as a radical scavenger. Except this isn't scavenging radicals. It's using radicals to its advantage, which I think is fucking insane. I think this is, this is wild, ridiculous. Yes? Very cool. Very good. Good job. You guys got there. You, you did the work. Isn't it? Overall reaction? Ah, uh, we're not going to do an overall for this. I have to split it into parts. Let Q, cytochrome C. Yes? Cool. How are we doing in orgo, people? Yeah? Fine? Fine. What comes out of complex three? Complex four. 
Complex four is quite easy, actually. Cytochrome C reduced. Cytochrome C reduced transfers electrons to oxygen. Oh, by the way, sorry, complex three, I didn't write the name. QH2 cytochrome C oxidoreductase. QH2 cytochrome C oxidoreductase. And it's CoQH2, CoQ, coenzyme Q. Anyone ever seen a vitamin called CoQ10? That's coenzyme Q. It speeds up metabolism. Complex four is called simply cytochrome C what? Cytochrome C what? Well, it transfers into oxygen, so it's just called cytochrome C oxidase. Because there's no oxidoreductase, it's just oxidase. Oxygen is just oxidizing. That's what oxygen does. It's called oxygen, right? Dude got the whole fucking class named after him. <sighs> and the reduced form of cytochrome C has Fe3+, plus, sorry, Fe2+, plus, and it turns into Fe3+, plus, and it goes back into complex 3 and continues this whole cycle. The overall reaction is four cytochrome C reduced or Fe2 plus cytochrome C plus four H plus plus oxygen yields four cytochrome C reduced, sorry, oxidized or Fe3 plus plus two H2O. And that favorability also pumps protons through the membrane. So complex four pumps, and complex three pumps, and complex one pumps, and complex two does not. Complex two is celibate. Good? OK. What? Oh, hold on. I get so scared when you guys look this way, because I think there's something wrong with the camera. <laughs> I got horrified. I literally just bought more iCloud storage so that I could uh, record. Yeah, right. And also, like, I don't know why, but now that it's, like, syncing my iCloud, I can't download my videos because they're, like, in the middle of syncing up and, like, it, oh, fuck. it's, like, delaying everything. It fucking sucks. Being a content creator is the worst. <laughs> I would never do OnlyFans. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I wouldn't do OnlyFans. Because fuck data. <laughs> That's the only reason. <laughs> That's the only thing stopping me. <laughs> Imagine. <laughs> So let's do something, right? Let's do something. Let's say we have a membrane. So this is the inner membrane of the mitochondria, correct? We are very, very, very zoomed in to a specific portion of the membrane. 
Can you guys visualize that in your heads? That we are incredibly zoomed in to a specific part of the membrane that contains all the complexes. I couldn't think of another shape. <laughs> okay. What? <laughs> They're laughing at my shape. <laughs> All right. So. Q to QH2, right? I'm going to draw that a little bigger. Hits Q and turns into QH2. And that's going to cross over into complex 3. I'm just going to write succinate. Fumarate. Right? F A D F A D H two on two more iron sulfur, iron sulfur, Q. Q H two. Yes? Yeah. I'm just going to say these are involved, right? And I'm just going to say Q pool. And that turns cytochrome C ox. Fe3 plus into cytochrome C red Fe2 plus. And four of those will encounter an oxygen and make H2O and give back cytochrome C ox Fe3 plus to come back here. And the Q pool will regenerate QH2. And this will pump. And this will pump. A very, very, very crude drawing of the electron transport chain. And remember that from here, it's pairs, pairs, and now it's one electron from here. You all right? Hanging in there? <laughs> I, I'm just going to tell you guys about NADH, NADH shuttles. So NADH actually can't cross into the mitochondria. Like the NADH itself can't move. So it uses shuttles to get through. So what happens is that you turn DHAP into 
glycerol 3 phosphate. And then there's a glycerol 3 phosphate shuttle, right? So the glycerol 3 phosphate moves through and then it gets oxidized again. So it's a way of carrying the electrons. So basically, you have a molecule which can move through if it's reduced. So the NADH, it gives its electrons to that molecule, like, glycer like turns d hap into glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate. And that molecule now holds the electrons, and it moves through, and then it get gets oxidized on the other side by NAD. So do you guys see how the electrons moved through? You guys get that? Yes? OK, so that, that's just a note. I don't think I've ever been asked about them, but it just says know that there are shuttles, because they might come up in passages. There's also a malate aspartate shuttle. So malate on the outside can come in, and then malate enters the TCA cycle. Malate gets turned into oxaloacetate. That makes NADH. And when it gets pumped back out, Eventually, our oxaloacetate gets turned into aspartate, and that aspartate comes out, and then it gets turned back into oxaloacetate outside, and then malate, and then it comes back in NADH. And it's a way of just cycling the NADH in and out of the mitochondria. Do you need to know that to great detail? Not really. There is a whole part of the chapter about ATP synthase. All I want you to know is that there's multiple subunits, right? There's multiple subunits. And the subunits, if you were to look at it, it kind of goes like this. So this is, our, this is our little hole. And then it comes out like that. And the subunits here, they kind of form a little fan. They form a little fan, right? And what happens is that the ADP kind of exists in there, and then it spins the fan. So what happens is that all of this H plus that you've built up here, is going to move through here. And as it moves through, the fan's going to spin. And the energy created by the fan spinning takes ADP and adds it to PI and makes ATP. That's all you need to know. So Laura, in repetition, because you weren't here, this is important. No, it's fine. Don't be sorry. You have a lot of H plus over here. In ATP synthase, it has multiple subunits, right? And the subunits, they hold on to phosphates and ADP. And when the H plus comes down, it spins those subunits around like a little fan, like a little generator. And when the ADP and the PI are like hit together inside that fan, they make ATP. Now, the important thing here is that this whole process, everything we just did up to the reduction of oxygen, which is exactly what we want to do, all of that as a whole is delta G negative. Why? Because the addition of ADP to PI is very delta G positive. So we did all this to create enough potential energy through the proton motive force, right? Through the proton motive force to come down through the synthase and power a delta G positive reaction. Clash those repelling subunits of the molecule together and make ATP. Oh. I think I wrote PMV in my notes, and that's why I just like. Does PMV have a medical meaning? That might be it. Hold on. Prolonged mechanical ventilation. It was from last unit. Okay. Pulmonology. When it's spinning, you said the ADP and the... The ADP and the PI, they like crash together and then they attach, basically. 
there's there's really cool diagrams of how ATP synthase works. It's a lot more complicated than that, but you guys should, should go check it out. There's like an alpha and a gamma subunit, and then the subunits move, and then it, it's cool. So there's like an empty slot, and then the slot picks up the phosphate, and then it crashes into ATP in the next one, then it makes ATP, but then that one's empty again, and then it spins. So this entire process is activated by high oxygen and high ADP, so a low ATP to ADP ratio of the cell. And this is turned off by low oxygen, which allows for NADH and FADH2 to accumulate, which shuts down the TCA cycle, which leads to buildup of acetyl-CoA, which shuts down the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex, which leads to buildup of pyruvate, which means that pyruvate will get turned into lactate, and that's anaerobic respiration. We talked about how the formation of lactate produces NAD to go back into glycolysis and give us back the two ATP each and every single time, which is the alternative to doing this. But this is a lot more efficient. You know what? I'm happy you asked. Glycolysis gives us two ATP and per molecule of glycolysis or per molecule of glucose, and it makes two pyruvate. PDH gives us. One NADH, NH plus, for one molecule pyruvate. So it gives us two NADH, net two NADH, NH plus. And two A-CoA. TCA cycle gives us 3 NADH, NH plus, 1 FADH2, 1 GTP per ACOA. Multiply all that by 2, and you get a net of 6 NADH, NH plus, 2 FADH2, 2 GTP. And that's it. Your ACOA goes away in the form of CO2. Okay, so overall, we got 2 plus 2 plus 6 is 10 NADH, NH plus, 2 ATP, 2 GTP, and 2 FADH2. Yeah? missing anything? I feel like that number comes out a bit low. No, it doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't come out low. So this, we're just going to convert into 4 ATP. Because the GTP can just swap for ATP, and that's good. So from here, we get 4. Plus, how many ATP do you get per NADH? For every NADH molecule, how many ATP do you get? 2.5. 2.5 ATP per NADH, NADH plus. So if we have 10, that's going to make 25. That's a lot. That's a lot of ATP. And for every FADH2, you get 1.5 ATP.
for FADH2. So that's what's 1.5 times 2? 3. 4 plus 25 is 29, plus 3 is 32 ATP per molecule of glucose. My counting may be wrong. It might be. It might be. I don't think it is, but if I miss an NADH or an FADH2 or some ATP somewhere, it could be different. My math says 32. I fully admit that I could be wrong. I've fucked this up countless times while studying. Uh, one NADH and H plus for one molecule of pyruvate. So you have two of them. So you get two. Yeah. Yeah, right here. Uh, so you could use those by itself, You could, yeah. So, so G, it's just that ATP, GTP, CTP, like they're using different energy formats, right? But it's the same amount of energy. So we say that it's basically just ATP. And it can be transferred between. Yeah, the end of chapter 10. Thank you for watching.